This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. From Erie to Philadelphia and from Scranton to Pittsburgh, it's Behind the Headlines. Hi, I'm Charlie Greenewalt, Senior Fellow of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. I'm joined as usual by my co-host, Mara Donnelly. Hi, Mara. Hello, Charlie. Why, uh, what have you been up to since our last show? Uh, binging Game of Thrones. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I am trying to keep track of the Lieutenant Governor as he oh, moves through the Commonwealth. Oh, yours is much more important than mine. <laughs> <laughs> no. And someone who's very knowledgeable about state government and local government is our guest today. And that is Dave Sanko, the Executive Director of the Pennsylvania State Association of Township Supervisors. Dave, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, it's, it's nice of you to come back again. Um, the last time you were here, we talked a little bit about a big event that your association has every year, and that's coming up between April 8th and April 12th. Uh, and uh, this has been, week has been set aside by uh, Pennsylvania government to honor local government. Uh, would you please sort of explain to the people who have perhaps not tuned into earlier shows, sure. uh, wh how local government works in Pennsylvania, what townships are, and what the responsibility of township governments are, Dave. Sure. Well, I think local government uh, is not uh, not just another layer of government. It's, uh, it's actually the foundation of, of all governments. Uh, and it, uh, local government will deliver for you the services that you you come to that you expect on a daily basis. It touches you uh, with with your roads, uh, with your uh, water and, and sewer systems. If you have a, a community park, uh, if there are, are things with health and safety, if you have a police department or a, a fire department, volunteer fire services, or all the responsibilities of making sure communities are, are safe. And and local governments do that best because they are just that. They're your neighbors who make those decisions. And they're not, uh, uh, you know, uh, as, as we learned 300 years ago, they're not a king in some faraway land who's trying to, to tell you what to do. So uh, we're coming up on Local Government Week then, and you're having a big event. Tell us a little bit about your, your event and why you do it and, and what the benefits are for townships. Well, we have our, our annual conference uh, that will be coming up uh, right, uh, right after Local Government Week. Uh, and uh, it's where we bring together uh, over, uh, over 3,500 municipal officials uh, for them essentially to learn best practices. Our job is to, to help them learn better ways to serve their communities, to be efficient and affordable, to provide the services uh, in a, in a taxpayer-friendly way, uh, to help them understand the difference uh, as they go and, and make budgets in their communities, uh, the difference between what, uh, what a community needs uh, versus what a community wants. I mean, everybody wants to have everything, but you can only afford to have the things that you can afford to have. Right. Dave, what do townships give uh, our citizens that they don't get from uh, federal government or from state government? Uh, common sense. <laughs> <laughs> Efficiency, <laughs> affordable, affordability. Uh, I think as we uh, the, the the inclusion of of civility. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we don't see a lot of uh, a lot of civility coming out of uh, coming out of Washington or Harrisburg. Uh, but I think in, in local government brings all those things to the table because because they're your neighbors. Uh, they're 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 folks who you see at uh, the ball field and at church and the park and the grocery store, uh, who who come together to to make for a uh, better quality of life in a community. They're also the ones that um, set, up, set about giving you a lot of unfunded mandates as well, the state and federal. The, the state and federal do bring uh, a lot of unfunded mandates, and part of that comes, I think, uh, in, in not, not to be defensive uh, of them, but part of that becomes is because they, they just don't know uh, what it's like in a small community, and it's you know easy to, to make these pronouncements from on high. It's like, well, fix this and do that, uh, but, but somebody has to pay for that. Dave, your annual conference is coming up in Hershey. Generally, your association always has it in Hershey, um, between April 14th and 17th. And this is local government uh, week as well, as Mara mm -hmm. was saying. Could you help our viewers visualize this event? I know the first time I attended, I was swept off my feet because of the size of it and the array and range of things that were uh, there and had special uh, special booths. I wonder if you could try to talk a little bit about this year's sure. Uh, event. Sure. 
Well, I think when you go in uh, recognizing there are, are literally thousands of people uh, from all around Pennsylvania <laughs> yes, it's true. Uh, who come together to hear uh, general session uh, speakers. They help us set association policy uh, by resolutions that come from, from townships and then the, through their county associations. Uh, we have over 300 different vendors who come uh, and display things from uh, sweepers to lawnmowers to dump trucks to uh, all the things that that have traffic signals uh, computer systems uh, mm -hmm. to keep track of your tax base uh, to keep track of uh, uh, bill collections I mean all of the things that make make a local government uh, make a local government work from nuts to bolts nuts to <laughs> bolts it's a lot of the behind the scenes things that that you don't necessarily see the a lot of engineering companies uh, that, that help figure out how to how to do things smartly well, I, you have a lot of different sessions, you said, and I, I heard that there are some pretty great speakers this year. Who do you have coming to present? We, we have uh, just some incredible, uh, over uh, almost 100 workshops uh, going oh. on with, with speakers from uh, uh, a lot of state agencies, some federal folks. We have a great, uh, great session coming on, on pipeline safety, on open records. Uh, but our general sessions will include uh, both uh, the governor and lieutenant governor. Uh, great. Uh, the Attorney General, uh, the uh, House Majority Leader, uh, and the Senate Senate Majority Whip. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, Sherry Collins, uh, who is the Executive Director of uh, the Governor's Broadband yeah, Initiative. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I think just a, a real jam-packed uh, session. And then on Wednesday, our, our out-of-town guest speaker uh, is uh, uh, retired Air Force uh, pilot uh, Heather Penny, uh, who oh. was tasked with, uh, she was one of the two planes in the air on September 11. Uh, whose job was to bring down uh, Flight 93 before it hit Washington. Uh, so she has an interesting story to tell. Oh, that'll be fascinating. Yeah. Well, Dave, there will be uh, all kinds of township supervisors there and the secretaries that work for them, uh, some of the other uh, township managers. Uh, everybody's going uh, there, and hopefully some of them are looking to learn things, learn new skills, um, new information. What opportunities are going to be available at the event for local government uh, officials to enhance their skills? Uh, it's uh, almost uh, an alphabet soup of, uh, of opportunities, if you will, uh, from, from stormwater to open records, uh, from uh, uh, traffic and road, road repair things to uh, uh, broadband expansion, uh, telecommunications issues, uh, trash, uh, public works. Uh, parks and recreation, uh, just a, a, a myriad of, of opportunities uh, to, to learn things. A lot of personnel uh, practices, best practices, and ways to help you avoid uh, litigation and save money. Before we move off of your conference, can you give us your website address so people can get some additional information? Our website is uh, psats.org, P-S-A-T-S dot O-R-G. Okay, great. So in swifting, shifting gears here a little bit, um, you did mention that the governor is coming. He has a new initiative called Restore PA, which is providing some funding to local governments. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about what that is and what do you think of it? We, we are anxious to hear more about, uh, about the governor's initiative, Restore PA. Uh, is a four and a half billion dollar uh, borrowing program oh. uh, to uh, pay for a lot of uh, a lot of different services. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we're, we're anxious to learn whether I don't know whether local government is the the recipient of those dollars. I mean, I think in many instances these dollars are are things that the state should be paying for anyway, oh. uh, and it's a, and it's a nice new way of, Who's of funding do the borrowing? it. Or is uh, the, the, state, the state would the do the borrowing. The state would okay. borrow uh, four 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 and a half billion dollars over the course of four years, and the governor's intent is to to repay that debt service uh, with a natural gas severance tax. Uh, so. Oh. Uh, this really is a, a, uh, a an opportunity to to put a lot of candy on the table uh, and then tell you the price is yeah. uh, you have to do a severance tax and we're, we're anxious to hear about it. Our association doesn't have a specific policy on a severance tax. Uh, we were early supporters of the impact fee uh, and thought that the money, if given a choice uh, between going to Harrisburg or going to local communities, we thought it should be in local communities, uh, and I think that's worked out well. Okay. So we have to stay tuned on that. <laughs> we're we're going to stay tuned. We're anxious okay. to hear. Uh, he's our, our one of our. He's our, our kickoff speaker on Monday morning. So okay. uh, I think he'll set the tone. Okay, we're anxious great. to hear. Great. Well, that may be a good segue to the fact that uh, after the conference, uh, you're faced with a, a new general assembly uh, that you'll be working with here in Harrisburg for the next two years. What does your association hope to accomplish? 
for townships and local government over the next two years on the Hill, Dave? Well, I think that, uh, you know, we're, we're very excited uh, about the opportunity with, I mean, there are 50 new members uh, of the legislature. So that's, the biggest that's almost, that's the largest, largest freshman, freshman class, class in, yeah. in anybody's memory. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of opportunity to, to maybe do things differently, uh, but there's also a lot of opportunity to, to spend time educating to make sure you don't make the same mistakes again and do things wrong a second time. Uh, so our, our jobs, we're, we're anxious in trying to help solve uh, uh, the emergency services, fire emergency services crisis. I mean, that is a huge problem facing Pennsylvania. Uh, broadband access across Pennsylvania is a huge problem facing most of our communities. Uh, transportation funding. Uh, is is a very large problem. Uh, so there there are a lot of uh, a lot of things that that I think have uh, risen to the level of of getting statewide attention that impact local governments. Uh, and, and a lot of those things are unfunded mandates that we've got to figure out how to how to fund. Uh, and hoping hoping that this gives us the opportunity for some new revenue opportunities. Do you uh, do any events or invite all the new? folks in to learn more about your association and what you do or? We, we try and uh, generally do those on one-on-one -on -one settings. That's good, uh, yeah. And try and do that, but there will be, there are gonna be a number of events over the course of, uh, the course of the next several months and a couple have already passed where we go and meet with, uh, meet with new members. Do you get legislators at your conference? Uh, we, we do. Uh, okay. there, uh, uh, usually we do a, a legislative reception, uh, oh. but when we originally set up the conference, they were not supposed to, they weren't going to be in session, so we didn't plan on doing a reception this year. Uh, but we will be, uh, we'll be inviting them down to, uh, to a very special event on, for dessert on Monday evening. Oh, great. <laughs> well, Dave, you've worked on the Hill, and Mara's worked yeah. on the Hill, and I've worked on the Hill, and uh, we would have to probably concede there are newly elected um, members who, from time to time, they don't know the difference between a borough and a township. And uh, what are you going to do? What can your association do to try to help them um, with this uh, learning curve? Well, I think one of the things that we, we help them try and help them understand is that, uh, you know, I mean, townships represent 95% uh, of the land mass in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's, it's approaching 6 million uh, of our residents live in, live in townships. Uh, and uh, those, those are the local building blocks of communities that help provide provide for good quality of life. I mean, they do things affordably. Uh, they don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of the infrastructure, uh, the, the older uh, infrastructure challenges uh, that were built 50 and 75 years ago that are in need of replacement uh, because they were, were largely rural farming, farming communities. Uh, but they have, they have developed uh, and they are uh, places where, where a lot of people live. I know critics will say there's still more, more deer and trees across Pennsylvania. Uh, and there certainly are a lot of a uh, lot of deer and trees, and that's why we have a great uh, great hunting opportunities and great har hardwood councils. Uh, before we run out of time, I want to go back to one thing you mentioned: um, the fire services issue. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. It's been I know we've talked about it before, but it remains an issue. I, 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 Thirty years ago, there were three hundred thousand volunteer firefighters in Pennsylvania. Today, there are less than fifty thousand. Uh, everybody's busy doing lots of different things, uh, but you know we still Pennsylvania was the, the the birthplace of volunteer fire services. We need to be able to make sure those volunteer fire services continue to survive into the future, uh, because frankly, the alternative, uh, which is go to a paid fire service, would would drive every community in Pennsylvania into bankruptcy. Uh, the fire, state fire commissioner estimates those costs to be eight billion with a B, oh eight billion dollars, yeah. uh, and that's just a property tax burden that Pennsylvanians can't afford. So right. we want to make sure that we work with the legislature uh, and the administration to find out ways to incentivize volunteerism mm -hmm. and to make sure the, the volunteer fire services remains a part of our future. Okay, well, Dave, we wish you great success with your conference. We look forward to your next uh, show with us, and uh, we look forward for you to come right back after this. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Pennsylvania State Association of Township Supervisors, the largest, most influential municipal association in the Commonwealth. Since 1921, PSATS has been preserving and strengthening township government and securing greater visibility and involvement for townships in the state and federal political arenas. Covering 95% of Pennsylvania's land mass, townships represent 5.5 million residents, more than any other type of political subdivision in Pennsylvania. Behind the Headlines is also brought to you by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, helping hospitals provide healing, health, and hope to communities across the state. 
and by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. The Pennsylvania Chamber serves as the frontline advocate for business on Pennsylvania's Capitol Hill by influencing the legislative, regulatory, and judicial branches of state government. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, by the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation, and by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Visit pahighwayinfo.org. Hi, welcome back to Behind the Headlines. On this segment, uh, we're joined by Jeannie Arnold. Jeannie is one of the leading uh, philanthropists in Pennsylvania, along with her husband, uh, Edward Arnold, uh, and she uh, serves in so many um, community uh, roles uh, and public uh, roles. It's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, uh, you want to tell us some of the things that you're on? For example, you're on the board of the... I'm on the national board of the Boy Scouts of America. Mm -hmm. I'm on the board of the Hershey Med Center, uh, Lebanon Valley College, and uh, really started an initiative called Better Together Lebanon bringing a lot of organizations together, so it keeps me busy. I bet it does, <laughs> and you're one of the leading uh, one of the leading contributors to the Fulton Opera oh, the House Fulton in Theater. Lancaster Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. I yeah. don't know, it, it's a full-time job <laughs> with all those things, Jeannie. But um, in today's society, we have less and less volunteerism, and we seem to have a greater need for the organizations that uh, instill character and uh, can bring people together and certainly one of the biggest one of those has always been the Boy Scouts Absolutely. and uh, you find that uh, you are the first woman who's ever been appointed to the Boy Scout board and the executive board which is really an honor mm -hmm. um, it I, I hope that we can get more women on the board I think it's very important particularly now where we you know the direction that we're heading with girls involved I think it's just important to do that well, alarmingly, I find in sort of my day-to-day -day life that uh, people seem to know far less about many of our uh, civic organizations, the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, than they uh, used to. Could you sort of give us a quick primer? Um, mm -hmm. Why were the Boy Scouts created in the first place? Well, what I need was there in society for them? It's really fascinating, and I'm just going to look at some of my notes uh, going through this, but the Boy Scouts actually started in England, okay. and uh, how it happened, there was a uh, Lieutenant Baden-Powell who wrote a book. He was in the military. He actually served 217 days in defense during the South Afri um, African War, mm -hmm. and he was eventually knighted by the Queen, but he wrote a book uh, called scouting for boys and this he basically trained the infantry the inter infantry groups underneath him and used these man made you know the um, manual for them and eventually it got published and because he was such a hero in England uh, the boys just knew they knew about this gentleman well in 1900 uh, then he wrote another book called Aids to Scouting, and this was to teach the boys how to do tracking, uh, organizing troops, and mapping, and cog recognizance, and boys just loved it. And he had such a positive response that that's where scouting started in England. And then uh, the interesting thing as far as it getting to the United States was there was a newspaper gentleman that was in Chicago, and his name was uh, William Boyce. Mm -hmm. And he got lost, uh, this was around 1909, and he got lost in Chicago during a real bad fog storm. And a young man came up to him and he asked him for directions, and uh, the boy told him where to go and walked with him, and then William wanted to give him a tip, and he said, no, I can't accept a tip, I'm a Boy Scout. And that's how the Boy Scouts started in the United States. And it was originally to have uh, five to seven young men together and uh, working with a leader. The, the big goal, I think one of the things that I see is the leadership. And when um, the Boy Scouts go through the different levels, 
and then they become Eagle Scouts, which there were 52, over 52,000 this past year that got Eagle Scouts. And with that, you have to put together the whole thing. You have to raise the funding for a project and then build it. So uh, there's a lot going on now, you know, with the Scouts, but essentially that is the history. In other countries, girls are, the girls are part of the Boy Scouts in other countries. It, we just haven't done that here in the United States until recently. And the only five countries that don't have scouts are North Korea, Andorra, let me see, I have to look at my notes, China, Cuba, and Laos. Laos. Every other country has Boy Scouts and girls are involved. Um, and then this summer, we have an international jamboree at the summit, which is a high adventure camp in West Virginia. And we have six, there'll be 60,000 uh, that will be there representing 151 countries. Now, so to go back for a moment, you, so Boy Scouting in America actually started in Chicago. That's right, okay. it did. It did. Uh, and now it's in all 50 states, isn't it's, it? It's all states. There And there are four high adventure camps in addition to, you know, what they do to at their local level. There is uh, the high tier, which is in Minnesota. There now, is... Well, what, now you have to slow... Oh, that would be... Me. So there are high adventure camps. How many of them are there's there? There's four. There's four. And, and they are run in the summertime. They run during the summertime. Okay. And there's the high tier, which I think is in... I'm sorry, it was Minnesota. Okay. There is uh, Philmont in New Mexico, mm -hmm. which is high adventure. There is um, the Summit that is in Bechtel, West Virginia, and that's the newest one, and there really is high adventure there. There's, you know, um, all kinds of things that boys can do. I mean, real, real uh, zip lines and just a lot of fun stuff. And then the other one, which is really fun, is the Sea Scouts, which is in the Keys in Florida. And I've driven past that yeah. <laughs> that uh, camp uh, several times, and I know several uh, scouts who've actually gone to that uh, camp, and they had a wonderful it's, time. It's a beautiful. I, yeah. What is the future of these camps, uh, the high adventure camps, going to be? Uh, were they going to continue into the future along the same path? Do they hope to expand in different ways? Uh, or hasn't that been addressed at this point, I, At this point, I think uh, the summit was, I think it was three years ago, three to four years ago that that was opened uh, for the first group. And I think really um, getting that, getting everything there that they need is they're still working on. The other ones are pretty consistent with what is offered, what's available. But now girls have the opportunity to go, you know, to these high adventure camps as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and not to take away from what they do with their own troops back home. Uh, there, you know, there's the scout law, there's the, um, the, the 12 points for a scout. It, leadership is so important. And, you know, it was interesting because I looked back to see how many presidents had been Boy Scouts. Oh, quite how, how many? Well, there were, uh, what I could get, there were four. Okay. And it was Clinton uh, and Bush, both Bushes. Um, Ford did go on to become an Eagle Scout. He okay. was the only one of the presidents that became an Eagle Scout. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. I never knew that before. Yeah. Well, you. John Lennon was a Scout, and you know it was. There's oh just my. some fun facts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you made reference to the girls. You referred to the girls. There have been some changes dramatic changes in the Boy Scouts in the last two years. Uh, and you've been right in the middle of all this. Right. So if you could please, can you explain to our viewers what happened uh, over the last two years in terms of bringing girls into the Boy Scouts? What happened and why? Well, I think that what was occurring was in many of the camps or the, the troop meetings, the boys would come and their sisters would be with them. You know, and what are you going to do? You can't tell the sister she can't come. <laughs> and so, the, you know, it's, uncomfortable. it's uncomfortable. This in. was happening a lot, particularly mm -hmm. uh, we're very close with one of the, the, the masters down, Cub masters down in, not a Boy Scout rather, in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And you'd have these um, Hispanic children coming and it would be the whole family. And they'd be doing the, you know, whatever the activities were, but they weren't getting credit for it. So it became more of a thing of, of, of family. How do we pull the, you know, and today everybody's so busy and if you've got 
uh, children that are going to multiple places, that can be very hard to manage. Well, families were coming. That's wonderful because then a variety of families coming right. together. And they were all working together. They're working together. So this was part of it. It was, and again, um, at when you reach the Venture Scout, which is age uh, 14, girls are part of that already. So what they did was they started with girls being able to come into Cub Scouts, and then um, the Boy Scouts followed. This this year it's starting. So it's there's 77,000 girls that have joined the Cub Scouts, and then we'll see how we do, go with the Girl Scouts. Now at the lowest levels, uh, Boy Scouts have. Um, um, what are the what's the lowest level they are um, wolf with the girl scouts it's brownies it's brownies it's brownies right. so um what are the brownies and the cub scouts are they going to be mixing as well i don't think so what age does the are girls allowed to participate then in the boy scouts in the boy scouts it would be age 11. age 11. age 11. And in so, the boy scouts okay younger in the Cub Scouts. Okay, so it's the Cub Scouts and the Brownies. Yeah. Right. All right, right, so they'll continue to operate the way they always have. Uh, in the last two minutes that we have, Jeannie, could you uh, just touch on one or two of the most important uh, accomplishments that the Boy Scouts are responsible for in our society over their lifetime? Well, I think it's leadership. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you look at, um, you know, the positions and like, for example, one of the interesting t statistics is 85% of the FBI, I don't, right now I don't know if that's good or bad, but 85% of the FBI have been scouts. Um, it, it, because of the, the, the focus on leadership, on community, on helping others, being loyal, being respectful, being courteous, these things that we need so much in today's world. We need that to be taught, not all the negative. And, I, I just think that if we, can, you know, we'll continue this changes, and it, we're trying to adapt to what really the future is calling for. Uh, obviously, it would be it would have been great if the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts could get together, but they're they're just different the way they're set up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the the reason for it is that you know it was happening. A lot of it was happening. So a lot of what you, you're mentioning here is related to character. Uh, education uh, and it's something that has been declining throughout the rest of our society over several generations. Uh, some families do a good job of it, some families not so much any longer. So it's good to have the Boy Scouts there as one of the institutions that can work on character right. formation in our youth. And Ed and I have supported Scout Reach, which is money that has been put into uh, a trust fund for those areas where they can't afford to go in Scouts. Scouts is not, you know, there's a cost, obviously. And there are areas where they can't get the leaders because everybody's working a couple jobs. So actually, there's funds there to pay those people to, you know, and have the, the Scouts there. Okay. Well, yeah. Jeannie, we want to thank you so much for joining us today. And we look to have you back in the near future to tell us about uh, how the Scouts are progressing. I will do that. And we will be with you again next week on Behind the Headlines.